Everyone uh, doing well this morning? You doing okay? Good, good, good. Um, I want to ask you that you, uh, after we're done doing this, um, don't take off. Pastor Jay wants to talk to you guys for a few minutes, so uh, after we uh, get done sharing God's word, don't take off. Um, so uh, I got a question for you guys, and feel free to holler out in church. How many people were born and raised in a church you couldn't talk in and your mom smacked you? Raise your hand. Ah, oh, that's a lot. Okay, this ain't that church, okay? We needed, we needed a sudden and momentous shift in the status quo. That's it right there, okay? So let me ask you guys a question. We're, we're here gathered under the banner of Jesus Christ. That's why we're here, right? We're here to hopefully let him hear your voice, which I think he heard your voice a little. We'll have another song in a little bit. But also, we want to hear his voice, right? So it's kind of like this wonderful exchange. He hears from you, you hear from him. We walk out better than we were when we got here. That's the goal. But why, why, let me ask you a question. Why did this sovereign king of the universe, why did he leave his throne some 2,000 years ago, come down to this earth? Why did he come here? Tell me. Shout one out. Give me a reason. Because, cause, okay, because that was motivation, but what's, give, give me some reasons why he came. He was hungry. <laughs> What? Give me some real answers. Fix screw up, fix us screw ups. What else? Restore relationship to him. What else? Die for sin. To experience what we experience. Help. Hope. To give hope. These are all great answers. What's the other one? Fulfillment of the scriptures. <coughs> These are all great reasons. How about seek and save that which is lost, right? You do that. Um, make you feel, yeah, help you feel love and you're not feeling love. That's good. Uh, die for forgiveness. Who said that? Was that you back there, Mike? Yeah. Um, to set an example for us, right, on how we're supposed to live. How to be Christ-like if you can't see Christ and see what he does, right? Um, he obviously came to teach us some things. I mean, you open up the Bible, and it's just, like, if you look, all of it's his word, but specifically the man, Jesus Christ, in red, all that stuff, right, to teach us some things. And then in uh, John chapter 1, verse 8, I want to say that I think that's the reference. If I'm not correct, you can forgive me, please. But it says that nobody has ever seen God, but the Son himself, Jesus Christ, he has declared him. And so that we could, reveal, we could see the Father in a greater way. You know that Jesus once said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. No one has ever seen the Father and lived. He's a consuming fire, and if you look at him, you would be nothing. But we get to see the Father when we see his Son. These are all great reasons. They're all real. All the ones you shouted out are real. But here's another reason I want to offer this up to you, Luke 418 is where you'll find this. And he said, I came to set the captives free. Now that's a strange comment, really, because in the text itself, it doesn't say what that specifically means. And so that's why we have the Bible, so we could research, so we could look, so we could dig, so we could figure out what does it mean, Jesus, that you came to set the captives free. We, we all want to be free, right? Everybody wants to be free. And he said, I came to set the captives free. So I would, I would think you'd want to dig and find out. And I would offer this to you, loved ones, this morning. That every single person, not just in this room, but every single person that walks this earth is a captive in some way or another by our own making. Okay? By our own making. The Bible, which is true. No, hold on a second now. This is a Bible church. You guys were slackers right there. The Bible, which is true, Amen. right, says that whatever you choose to obey becomes your master. So no one or no thing is your master unless you tell it to be, okay? And I know that sounds kind of weird, but the Bible is true, and what you think and what I think doesn't matter, it is true, and it says that whatever you choose to obey becomes your master. So I would just say this, that there are people and there are cultural standards and traditions in our nation, 
traditions in our families, right? How many people have some family traditions? This country song's named that, right? How many churches have traditions, families, nations, people groups, ethnicities? We have traditions and perspectives. And right now, they are framing, shaping who you are and how you live your life. Now, you might not have thought about this, but I thought about this this morning. When every one of you got up this morning and got into your car, how many of you decided, you know what, honey, I think today we're going to ride on the left side of the street. <laughs> how many people thought that when they got in the car this morning, right? The thought never even entered your mind. I'm just going to, we went on a motorcycle ride yesterday. How do you think that would have gone? <laughs> hey, guys, let's go on the left side of the road this week. Right? That's going to work. Now, if you want to be rebellious and do your own thing, you're going to die, kill people, get your license taken away, and go to jail. But you can do it if you want. But listen, why do we automatically just get in the car this morning? You all did it. You got in your car, and immediately you went right to the right side of the road. Why? We're trained. That's our culture. Now, if you go to England, right, that might be a little bit different. If you go on the right side of the road, that could be a problem. But over here... We just instinctively go to the right because that's the tradition. That's the perspective that we have. That's what our culture teaches us. And we don't even think about that. And that's why I just wanted to slow you down. So you could just kind of think like, hey, man, everything I do is shaped by something or someone. And most of the time, you're not thinking about it, right? You're late. I got to get there. You just throw on clothing. That's a cultural standard. I'm glad that you fell for that one. Good. Yeah, praise the Lord, right? But look, in some countries, if we walked in like this, they'd think I'm crazy because they're all naked, right? Or maybe they just have a loincloth on or something like Tarzan. But, 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 but this is our culture, right? We have, a, we have shirts and we have pants and that's what we do. We're not thinking about this, but it's so very true. We're taught some things. We're taught in our schools. We're taught on TV, on the Internet, from well-intentioned friends and family, and they're telling us, you and I, how to live our lives. To, to sum it up, we're just a product of our environment, aren't we not? But Jesus said that he came to set you free. So what's that look like, right? Because when I hear that, I don't know about you, but I know my flesh man, like just my, my me, my Moses. When I hear that, I'm like, I you, give, you give a sinner, a broken person, Freedom, the idea of freedom, what do we want to, we want to run with that, don't we? What does that mean? I could do whatever I want to do, right? I want that. Isn't that, just, isn't that just our nature when someone says, hey, you can be free, we want to do whatever we want to do, and don't tell me what to do, I'm free. That's just our nature to do that. But I don't think that's what Jesus meant, and that's why we have the Bible, and we have to dig for that. What does freedom look like? Anybody in here want to be free? Anybody? Two people in the room want to be free. That's awesome. How many people in here want to be free? It's a little better. It's getting better. Let me ask you a third time. We'll go. Maybe it's the Trinity we need. How many people in here want to be free? Thank you. Let's try to do that the first time from now on, right, so we can just move on. You don't want me to go long here, do you? Okay. So here's what freedom looks like, okay? You ready? John 8, 31 and 32 says this. Well, Jesus said this. He said, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. What does that mean? Keep reading them, keep doing them, right? That would be faithful to my teachings, right? You're truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you Free. 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 So, so free, freedom doesn't mean run rampant, do whatever I want. All right? That's not going to work, Oprah. That's not the way it works. Kings all through the Bible, people in all through the Bible. Read the Old Testament. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Chaos. That wouldn't work. How about if everybody up here right now decided, hey, I'm going to preach instead, and they just come up here and start preaching while I'm preaching? And what if, what if he decided, you know what, I want to feel like preaching too while we're preaching. And then what if you decide you want to get up and you start preaching while I'm preaching and you're preaching and you're preaching. What's going to happen? 
It's ah! That's what freedom is when it's run amok. But that's not what Jesus taught. So what I gather, and I hopefully that you gather, is that free doesn't mean I get to do whatever I want. What free really means is living in submission exclusively to the only one qualified to be your master, and in so doing, you live in freedom, which is exactly how he made you to live. That's freedom. That, listen, we're all a slave of something. You remember months ago, I shared with this with you, do loss, right? We're not just buddies with Jesus. We're not just sons of God. We are slaves of God. Now, that might not be a term you wanted to hear in church today, but that's the truth of the scriptures. And, and, and Peter and Paul and James and, and a couple of the other guys, they start their letters in the Bible saying, I, Paul, a doulos of Christ Jesus. I'm a slave of Christ Jesus. That means that nothing else, no one else tells me what to do ever, only Jesus. That's it. He's qualified to be my master it's in my best interest to allow him to be my master. If, if, if my wife tells me what to do all the time and I follow her lead all the time, I'm going down. And I love her. Right? She's not qualified to be my boss. If Jay told me what to do all the time with the utmost respect that I have for him, that's a bad God. And he's going to send me sideways at some point. But Jesus Christ will never, someone say never, Never send me sideways. All things work out for the good to those who love the Lord and are called to his purpose. Is he working out his purpose in your life? If so, all things will work out for the good. If not, they won't. That's the bottom line. And that's what being the slave of Christ Jesus actually looks like. And so I want to address boldly, unashamed, unashamed this morning. I want to address one of the jail cells that so many of us are in, and I'm not going to soften it, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it in any way, shape, or form. Some might, I'm not. Because if I do, it will not help you, and it is absolutely not loving. To sugarcoat the truth is not a sign of love. That's weakness, and that's not a friend. Okay, if you have medicine for this headache that I have and you don't tell me how to get rid of it, that's not kind. And so I want to share with you something boldly, unashamed, and I'm going to talk to you this morning. And whether you like it or not, please sit in your seat. I want to talk to you about money this morning. Okay, I never talk about money. I've been doing this church for, for, for 10 years and I've preached one time about money. I've touched on it here and there when the text requires it, but it's never been the focus of a message. But I want to talk about money, and that doesn't mean I'm going to, it's not going to be like the, the church that passes the plate enough times until there's enough. That's not coming, okay? I'm not telling you to go bring your, your diamond rings up to the offering plate, and, and I'm not trading the deed for your house, and I'm not telling you to do that at all. I just want you to just relax, enjoy your seat, and let the word of God just soak in and have its way, okay? And, and, and some of you are going to hear everything I say, and you go, I'm tracking with that already, and that's going to encourage you, right? And some people are going to say, you know what, I'm, I'm kind of tracking with that, but I'm off a little bit, so I just got a little correction. And that's okay from daddy, right? Is that cool? Some of you are going to be totally, totally just off the deep end on this stuff, and you might get a rebuke from the Lord. And that's okay, too, because that's what good teaching is supposed to do, okay? So just let God's word shape your perspectives, shape your choices on spending and giving and saving and all that. Just, I would just say this as your pastor, please just remain faithful to God's word, okay? So no matter what the subject is, just be faithful to God's word. Remember, all things work out for the good to those who love the Lord and are called to his purpose, when you go to church, sometimes it's like going to the dentist. How many people like going to the dentist, right? But it's good for you. It's, it hurts sometimes, but it's good for you. Now, speaking about going to the dentist, 
I, I, I personally, I don't know about you guys, when I listen to pastors, there's certain guys that I listen to, certain guys you listen to, I like hammers. I like Tozer, right? I like Spurgeon. I like Wigglesworth, right? I like Jonathan Edwards, sinners in the hands of an angry God. That's what gets my attention, right? Some of you might not like that. Some of you like to listen to someone calm and, and gentle, and that's cool. Someone wants to listen to Erwin McManus, and it's like poetry preaching, and that gets your, like, that's awesome. I'm a Spurgeon Tozer guy. So speaking of, of, of Spurgeon, if you've listened to, he's one of those old dead guys that just, just said it like it was, and he didn't care. Now he definitely doesn't care. He's dead, right? And people quote him all the time. Well, he once said, because he's a hammer, he said this. He knew his preaching was a hammer. And so he said, what you do is you get them rolling in the aisles, and then you kick them in the teeth. Brandy, That's what he said. That's a direct quote. Good to see right? you. So Go ahead and have a seat. here's a chance yeah, to roll in the aisles first. That song? Clean hands, pure heart, good grace, good God. <laughs> you know who doesn't have clean hands? Mr. Scott over there. Saw him in the bathroom earlier. Did not wash his hands. <laughs> you sicko. <laughs> I'm just joshing you. Just joshing you. All right. My name is Brother Andy. You can call me Pastor. Very good to see you here today. Um, just a quick announcement before we get into our service. Uh, uh, starting next week, we are going to be 100% gluten-free at this church. All right? And that includes the communion bread. <laughs> I just found out that our favorite keyboardist over here, Scott, uh, he's pretty much allergic to everything under the sun. <laughs> you know it. And uh, that includes fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm kidding. Oh, my goodness. Oh, man. We're having fun here. All right. So what I want you to do is I want you to grab your wallets, pull out your purses, because right now it's offering time, and Papa needs a new jet. <laughs> I'm only being serious. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Sort of. <laughs> mm -mm -mm. Well, here it is. The time of church where we pass the offering plate. Hi. Presidential candidate Carl here. <laughs> Giving an offering to your church should be a joy celebration in response to God's provision. But unfortunately, it's not a huge priority anymore when it comes to most Christians. Heck, religious giving is down 50% since 1990. And that ain't right. So my campaign slogan this year is to make Sunday cool again. So may I present to you Church Hacks, top five ways to increase your church's offerings. Hope, there it is. Making tithing exciting. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. <laughs> holy. <laughs> it's like Kobe, but holy. Oh, someone's trying to make him my bucket. What are you going to do, huh? 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 What's you going to do? Trying to get What's that, 20? Uh-uh. Not my court, baby. Okay. Ooh. Watch out. Watch out. Watch out. Not my court, huh? What are you going to do? Oh. Oh. Ah. Ah. Let's go. This is my house. My offering plate. What's up? Hack number two, the accountability counter. Put this little gadget inside your offering plate or bucket, watch it do its magic. Andy Denoon, five dollars. That's, I mean, that's reasonable, okay. Is that I it? Mean, okay, you want you got more? any more? I got, I got more right here. Only three more that's dollars. I, that's all I have. And if that doesn't work, the accountability counter resorts to a more personal tactic. <laughs> Fun fact, Andy spent $60 on Chipotle before coming here. That was, was like... And he also wets the bed. It was an accident. Hack number three, the McLaughlin Maneuver. People love giving money to sad dogs. Oh, I actually don't have anything. I actually uh, forgot my wallet. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Poor dogs. I can't, I mean, like, I don't... Okay, all right, here we go, here we go. Oh, poor doggies. Hack number four, peer pressure. We know it's not a good idea, but neither is being in love with your money. Uh, can I, yeah, Where's your offering, you? Andy? Uh, I, I, my offering, I, I, for, I oh, forgot Oh, you forgot, you forgot it. Yeah, hmm? I uh, actually, no, 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 I forgot I gave online. That's what it was, <laughs> so I've already spent my money. We don't offer online, Andy. You don't? No. Uh, Let's put it in the bucket. Okay. Put um, it in the bucket. The, the thing is, okay, okay, all right, fine. Okay, just, okay, please. Put just it leave. in. Just leave, please. Rich young ruler over here, am I right? Oh, ah! And last but not least, hack number five, be forceful. And by that, I mean, use force. <laughs> 
Can I help? What? Where's your money, Andy? My, my t yeah, tithing. Um, offer, yeah. Um, sorry. Uh, um, here it is. Sorry. That doesn't yeah, look was... like ten percent, Andy. Uh, no, it's um, it's actually not. It's uh, it was like a really rough month with bills and everything like that. And so like, I hope it. No, you're lying to me, Andy. I, I'm not. I, I'm, not I'm, I'm not lying. I'm not to be trifled with. I, I, I know that. I know that. You will give me ten percent. I mean, I can't. Right now. Was that a Jedi thing? No, it's not Jedi, man. Kylo Ren. Is that are you, are you? Dark side. Okay, I just yeah. I, I mean, I don't have ten percent right now. It's gonna hurt me more than it hurts you. Wait, what is, what's gonna hurt? You good? Yeah, I'm fine. <sighs> can I take this off now? Yes, you can take it off. Thank goodness. Oh my gosh. It's really hot in that mask. I believe you. <sighs> Dark side is whack. <laughs> okay. Someone said, where did you find that? Okay, that's where Nick works. So that explains a lot about him. <laughs> that's a company over in Tavares, actually. They make T-shirts and stuff. You guys seen my uh, Jesus, Meredith, and Coffee T-shirt? That's where it came from. Anyway, um, probably the last laugh of the day. Why this message? Why now? Okay. Um, I want to start on the shallow end of the pool, the stuff that's probably the least significant, but I have a fiduciary responsibility to inform you of the financial health of the church that God has called you and I to, to worship him and to serve him and to make him known to this community, okay? And so as pastor, that's part of my job. So I want to say... Um, that when we opened up this church, this facility right here, it was my responsibility and only my responsibility to make sure that we are in a, a healthy position financially to exist and to achieve the, the great commission that God has given us to, to, to evangelize this community, okay? And so you have to you, you try to look and see what types of, of cost it's going to be. So for those of you that are new, just kind of visiting, just... This is family business, this first little part, but then we'll get into more significant things that pertain to all of us, okay? So just bear with me. Um, I, I, I recently reached out to some pastors here locally that have churches that are about our size, not only in population, but in size, square footage for, for mortgage or rent, okay? Those two, those two standards. And um, I found out that we are, in, when I tell them how much I pay for rent here, they look at me like this. And it's not because it's a lot. It's because they hate me because it's so little. So when you add up all of the, the, the rent and staff, and I just tell you, I'm the only paid staff member here, bless you, and insurance and utilities and supplies and money to pay for like our broadcast that people are watching right now, all that stuff, it costs $7,000 a month to run Revolution Church. Now to some people, that's an, obs that's an obscene amount of money. To me it is because I don't make a third of that. So I understand it's a lot, but compared to some, there's a church over in Eustis, I told them how much we pay total his rent is that, okay? His rent is that, and he's not on the 441. So just to give you an idea of, of what we're, what's going on here, okay? $7,000 a month. Now, just these are some, just some examples because these are the most recent. Last week, our offering was $1,400, and the week before, it was $700, okay? That's not going to keep this church open. It just does not keep the church open. So just very practical, that's just the practical of it, okay? And you can adjust how you see fit. But that's the, that's the shallow end of the pool. That, let's just get past that. Because let me just tell you something. I'm more than happy to do this in my living room with you. We don't need the building to do this, but if you want to keep this going right here, 
that's how much it costs. And it's insanely below what anyone, I had one pastor here locally, he texted me back, he said, I don't know how you do what you're doing with that. It's just crazy. Their pastor makes what our entire payment is, okay? But the thing that I really want to address is this, that the prevailing condition of the people in this church, now this is prevailing, it's not every single person, but prevailing condition is financial struggle. And I hate to see that for you. I really do. And, and, and I hear it daily in things like this. I need help with my medicine. I need help with rent. I need help with my cell phone. I need help with food. I need help with utilities. I need help. I need help. I need help. And it is, loved ones, constant in my ear. Constant. And it's not that I'm annoyed by it. I understand it. But I hate to see you have to live that way. Okay? And, and I want to just say this I'm poor. Listen, loved ones, but I don't struggle. For those of you that have known me and my wife for an extended period of time, you need to know that we have made the same amount of money since this church began, never a raise. We are below poverty, but listen, we never, ever struggle. There's a way to be wealthy but the, and blessed, and there's a way to be poor and still blessed, okay? And I want to help you with that. Here, here's what I saw. So a couple weeks ago, when we did our count of people here and the count of our offering, we had, we had 70 adults in the room, and our offering was $700. Now, if you're just tithing, just a 10% church, that would mean that the average adult made $100 that week. Now, if that's true, then the offering was just right, and the struggle is real. But the problem with that is that most of the people in this room, whether they're on fixed income or working, they made substantially more than $100 last week, but yet you're still struggling badly financially, and it's because your finances are not being shaped by the master and his word. That's the problem. Okay, that's the problem. Now, I want to read something to you, and I hope that you'll open up your Bible and let, let your eyes gaze at God's Word and let it shape your perspective in these things, okay? It's Malachi chapter 3, and we're going to read from verse 6 through verse 10. I'm going to give you a moment to get there. This is the dentist's office. I get it. Okay? Listen. Chapter 3, verse 6. You there? Holler out if you're there. Majority there? Okay, you ready? I am the Lord. I do not change. Okay? So what does that mean? This isn't just an Old Testament thing. I am the Lord, and I do not change change. What was valid then is valid now. Do you agree? Okay. I am the Lord. I do not change. That is why your you descendants of Jacob are not already destroyed. He's like, the only reason why I haven't killed you is because of me, not because of you. Okay. It's because I'm good, not you. I, I like he just gets baseline right then and there. He's not, he, God don't sugarcoat, right? He's my kind of preacher. Ever since the days of your ancestors, you have scorned my decrees and failed to obey them. Now return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord. And But you ask, how can we return when we have never gone away? And you're like, well, maybe that's you. Maybe this is you. Maybe he's speaking to you, right? I don't know. And God says this. Should people cheat God? Yet you have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? You've cheated me of the tithes and offerings due to me. You are under a curse, for your whole nation has been cheating me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there'll be enough food in my temple. 
If you do, says the Lord, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Now, this is, the, this is incredible. Try it. Try it. Test me in these things. He's like, let's just do, let's just do a, an offering challenge this week. He's like, why don't you just try? Just give it a whirl. That's what he's saying. Just give it a whirl. Just give it a whirl. And he actually asks you to challenge him in these things. See if I won't do what I said I would do. And what I see here, I don't know about you, but I see here is the picture of the Christian that struggles financially no matter how much money they make. You know why? You're under a curse. Stop. You're under a curse. Sit and listen and be patient. Sit and listen and be patient. Humble yourself before the Lord and just listen. Listen. Listen, and if you don't agree, you don't have to. Listen. More will make it better by itself. Promotions and pay raises and overtime alone won't heal the curse. As a matter of fact, sometimes these things don't happen to you because of that. We want God to prosper us. We want God to provide for us. But we won't put ourselves in the position that he's asking us to put ourselves in to receive that. God lifts the curse when you bring his, his 10%. You see it there. You have cheated me of the tithes and offerings due to me. It is his. And a lot of us think, well, how much of my money should I give? And that's where our first mistake is. 10% is his. What we should be deciding is what do we do with the other remaining 90 that he was so gracious to give us? All good and perfect gifts come from him. And so we decide what we're going to do with the money that he gives us. God lifts the curse when you bring his 10%, his tithe, and his offerings, which are above and beyond the tithe. These are the, this is the offering that you give of your own free will, representing gratitude and investment into the kingdom expansion. And when tithes and offerings are brought, God lifts the curse and opens the windows of heaven. That is what it says. And I am the Lord and I do not change. And when we do that, when the windows open, listen, loved ones, you have enough. And the storehouse is full so that we could help others. He's not asking you to do this so that you can get rich. He's asking you to do this so you can have plenty, so you can bring more and help others more. That's what he's done. The storehouse is the resources available for those that are in need, especially for those in the family of God. And in the New Testament, this is pictured so clearly in Acts chapter 2, verse 45, where it says they sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. More clearly, more precise, Acts chapter 4, verse 34. There was no needy people among them because those who owned such things, land and houses, would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. We see them grab hold of this truth. Now I said, I'm not teaching that you must sell your house and divvy up over the church the proceeds or to just sell it and bring all the money somehow to me and I'm going to give it out. That's not the case at all. These are examples of generosity in God's word that would help to shape you in the generosity that you would show. Now listen, if it was a, you must sell your house, (coughs) it would say it. God and his word are not afraid of the word must, ever. You must not worship any other gods but me, right? You must be born again. The word must is not in the shadows in God's word. It's brought out to the surface. And so it doesn't say you must do this. As a matter of fact, giving up everything that you have, which some people teach, you know, give it all away. You're a Christian. Give it all away. Give it all away. See, if you give up everything, that just makes you a burden to the church. And then you have nothing, right? And that's a problem. What the Bible teaches is not role reversal, where I'm rich and you're poor and so I'm going to be totally poor so that you guys can be rich that doesn't help at all now there's still someone looking for help that doesn't really help at all as a matter of fact the Bible teaches on this thing clearly 
Do me a favor and look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Second Corinthians chapter 8, look at verse 11. Now you should finish what you started. Let the eagerness you showed in the beginning be matched now by your giving. Give in proportion to what you have. Whatever you give is acceptable if you give it eagerly. And I'll, this is not right. Am I in the wrong place? 11 through 4. Yeah, yeah okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever you give is acceptable if you give it eagerly and give according to what you have, not what you don't have. Of course, I don't mean your giving should make life easy for others and hard for yourself, right? I only mean that there should be some equality. Right now, you have plenty and can help those who are in need. I want to pause there for a second. You're going to see in just a moment, even though he said you have plenty, he's, he's talking to a church that's poverty stricken and you're going to see that in a moment but yet somehow he says you have plenty and that should open up our eyes to the reality that I think you have a little bit more than what you think you have and that perhaps the uh, the desire to be generous is being squelched by your lifestyle that even if you wanted to be generous you couldn't be generous because there's things that are holding you captive and you you're not allowed to give generously because you can't but he says right now you have plenty and can help those who are in need Later, they will have plenty and can share with you when you need it. You see that? So it doesn't say, listen, I have a lot. I'm rich, right? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you all my money so that now you're rich and I'm totally broke and now i got to go to the storehouse and say, help me. What was accomplished in that? Nothing. Nothing. It's not a role reversal that, that God's word is teaching us here in any way. It's not me rich, you poor, or me poor, you rich. It's let's love each other and help one another out so that everyone is taken care of. That, that, that's it, especially those within the house of God. Now we're going to dive deeper here. But here on the surface, I'm not teaching you how to get rich. In any way, I'm not a prosperity guy in any way, shape, or form. I'm simply saying that if you bring your tithe, your 10% and your offerings, then there will be help for those that are in legit need and the curse will be lifted and the windows of heaven opened above us. That's what it says. That's all. That's what it says, okay? Now, here's more truth, okay? And just let it frame you. Don't resist. Just let Jesus set you free. What I'm telling you right there is not a jail cell it is freedom. It is freedom. It is freedom. And I have experienced this freedom firsthand. And I want it for you. Okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 8 also. Look at the first nine verses. Okay? And listen, the reason why I'm reading so many verses here is that all throughout the Bible it talks about different giving things, different giving verses. And I'm just going to pull up, pull up verses, isolated verses, and say, okay, that's what they did. This is what you do. Amen. Go home. That's not right. Okay, what I want to do is I want to read this entire little section here and, and just see, is the Holy Spirit just speaking to Corinth or perhaps he's speaking to you as well? Now, I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles and they are very poor. Do you see that? Now, a moment ago, it says, you have plenty. But yet he says, you're very poor. But they are also filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did it of their own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift of the believer's in Jerusalem. They even did more than we had hoped. <coughs> For their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us, just as God wanted them to do. So we have urged Titus, who encouraged your giving in the first place, to return to you and encourage you to finish this ministry of giving. Since you excel in so many ways, and so he starts 
listing off some things that they're really gifted at, really good at in the church. He says, in your faith, your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love from us, or in some translations, for us, I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. I am not commanding you to do this, but I am testing how genuine your love is by comparing it with the eagerness of the other churches. You know the generous grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, and this obviously you guys understand, that's not silver and gold. He's not walking around with Donald Trump money in his pocket. You know what I'm saying here, right? He's rich. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make you rich. It's the one thing that just jumped out when I read that this week. He said, generosity is not birthed from wealth. Generosity is birthed in joy. You get that? It's birthed in joy, right? Two weeks ago, we had our little joy talk, didn't we? And we talked about that joy is the result of making the choice to look and focus and stay focused on the goodness of God and on the good things that he's doing in your life. Rather than focusing on the trials and the tough stuff and the things that are really bothering us, remember Paul in 2 Corinthians 7, 4, he said that in our afflictions, I am overflowing with joy. Right? So, so our, our decision to be joyful comes from our, the, the decision of our will to focus on the good things of God and what he's doing in my life rather than focusing on the junk that's in my life. Even though I, Paul says, I have afflictions. Remember we read the list of afflictions? Whipped and beaten and shipwrecked and hungry and poor and this and that and everyone hates me. That's afflictions, y'all. And in that, overflowing with joy. Generosity is birthed in joy. Not in wealth. See, a lot of people are waiting to be wealthy and then they'll be generous. And that's not at all what the scriptures teach. <coughs> As a matter of fact, it said, a give in proportion to what you have, not what you don't have, right? There's a way to be generous with the little that you have right now, right? There's a way to be generous in the, in the little that you have right now. And, and we want God to provide, and we won't get ourselves in position for that blessing by being generous with the little that you have now. Look what it says, right? Give in proportion to what you have, not what you don't have. Don't be sitting there going, man, if I had a million bucks, then I'd buy a building for the church. No, I have a hundred bucks. God, I want to be super generous with that hundred that I have. What's that look like, Lord? What's that look like? Reflecting on the goodness of God is the delivery room of generosity. Has God been good to you? Has he been good to you? How? How? Say it. How? Come on, yell it out. He can hear you. He can hear every one of our voices at one time. He's got big ears. How has he been good to you? Have you been forgiven? Have you been washed clean of your rampant sin, even though you don't deserve it and didn't go after that? Have you been adopted into his family? Are you his son or his daughter by faith in Jesus Christ? We should be joyful, right? How many married guys out there? Raise your hand, right? You got a wife, don't you? As much as she drives you crazy, the Bible, which is true, and you're not, it says that she's a treasure and you found favor with the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for my wife. Anyone have any kids? They drive you crazy too, don't they? But they're a blessing from the Lord. Even Jackson. Anyone eat anything recently? Drink anything as of late? Anyone breathed yet today? Did you get here in a car? Do you have any clothing on? What do you have that you've not been given? <laughs> Everything. And that's why the early church was so freely giving stuff away all the time, joyfully, because they realized everything they had was from God. Right? All that I have and all that I now am is because God is good. And so I want to be generous 
just like he is generous. And so to listen, loved ones, to wait around for wealth to accumulate to then be generous is a hopeless endeavor. And it's sinful. It's wrong. That's not where generosity comes from. Generosity comes from joy. And if you can reflect on the goodness of God in your life, then you have much to be joyful about and you have much reason to be generous so that others can enjoy the same privileges that you've enjoyed, that you didn't deserve, that you didn't go after, and he pursued you with his life and death and resurrection so you could have all that stuff. And so all of that should make joy swell up inside of you and you should be doing what they do, begging for the privilege. How can I give? How can other people know about what I've been given? Instead, you got to have me get up here and say, listen, you guys need to give or we're going to close. What would it rather be, guys? Right? Come on. Don't, don't get, let's get past this. Let's get past all this. <clears throat> okay, now I'm going to really tick you off. Let's talk about how much. Listen, let, hold on. <laughs> Mike, thank you for... For, for sitting. How much does it mean here comes the giving commitment cards? Okay? That'll never happen here. Look at back in chapter 8. Look at verses 3 and 4. What does it say? I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did it of their own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. Here's, what, here's how much more. How does, does that mean? I don't know. But they gave more. It's not in the Bible so we could praise the people in Corinth. They were not praiseworthy. They were awful. Why is it in the Bible? More. More. Listen, more not because I'm pro poking and prodding and pressuring you. More of their own free will, right? Because they wanted to. Because they had joy overflowing for all that God had done for them. That's why they gave more than they could afford. How much can you afford today, this week, this month in your offerings? I don't know, but what did they do? They were poor. They gave more than they could afford. Why? Because they chose to. And not only did they choose to, but they begged for the privilege of doing it. Now just take that biblical example, the book that's supposed to shape our minds and lives, and take that and lay that over the predominant view of the offering time in the local church. And you see that there's a bit of a chasm, isn't there? More, how much means more? free will, and begged. That's our example. See, how much isn't specifically stated in this offering to the Jewish believers in Jerusalem? Now, the tithe, that's a 10% thing. He said that's his. But this, the how much of gratitude and investing in others, it's not specifically stated, right? And that's why when we do our offerings here at this church, we pray about that. That's what we do every single week, do we not? We pray, God, what does thanksgiving look like? What does gratitude look like? What does partnership with you to advance the kingdom of God look like? How can I be a part of what you're doing? My joy is overflowing. What does that look like? And then you get quiet and you listen to the Holy Spirit and you let him guide what you do. The Bible says we don't worry about anything, but we pray about everything. Right? So that's what we do when we give our offerings. Now here's some more. That's not enough. Here's some more biblical truth to help shape your life. Okay? Breathe. Romans 12, 9 says, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Really. Who likes phony and fake? I mean, down with the, 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 the unauthentic Christian platitudes of we love everybody. No, because we don't, okay? We don't. We might say that we do, but our lives tell a much different story, okay? People don't come to church for lots of reasons, but one of the main reasons is, is that they can sense and smell 
authentic. And so can you, right? And so they know that you're just a bunch of talk most of the time. They know all of us are a bunch of talk because the little that they know about who a Christian should be, we don't live up to it at all. <coughs> and so nobody likes that stuff. They just, don't just say it, right? Do it. Do it, right? So look at 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 8, verse 8. Look at it says. He's talking about this being generous and given, given, given. He says, but I'm not commanding you to do it. But I am testing how genuine your love is. I'm testing how genuine your love is. We have a graphic that goes up here sometimes during our offering time saying that giving is a, something like a, a practical expression of love. Like you can see love. When you're willing to sacrifice of your own like Jesus did so that others could be blessed... That shows real love. Will you sacrifice your NFL network? Will you sacrifice a, a, a dinner once a week? Will you sacrifice your, whatever it is that you spend on, would you sacrifice that for me? That's what people want to know. Will you sacrifice that for me? Will you really love me? You know why people love gangs? Because their gang members will lay their life down for that man. That's why. Now, it's violent and it's awful, and I get it, but that's why they go, because they feel loved in a way that they do not feel loved in a church. And God is love. And so where should the greatest feeling, expression, tangible view of love be, if not for here? Right? Here. And that comes, a lot of times, through your offering. I'm not commanding this of you, but I am testing how genuine your love is. And so I just want to say that generosity equals, to, in my view, it equals love. It equals love. Your offerings are a tangible evidence of your love for other people. Now here's why that's so important. John 13, 35 says that your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciple. That's why it's important. Not only are you helping to feed people and clothe people and buy their medicine and all those things, tangible things that they need, I get that. But love expressed to one another through your generosity within the body of Christ gives evidence of Jesus Christ to a watching world. They see him in a great way when we are generous. Okay? And what? And listen... Generosity stirs up other, genero other Christians to be generous, okay? You know the Bible talks about not letting your left hand know what your right hand did? I get all that, right? But there's also uh, this in, in Scripture, I'm going to read to you in a moment, there's also this part in the Old Testament, and you're going to see in the New as well, where David brought out all of his offering and presented it before all the people. And it says why. It says it was to inspire them to greater amounts of giving as well. See, this is what I've done, right? He said, look, I brought all my gold, my silver. I emptied out my accounts for the Lord in his temple. So you guys could come meet him there. He didn't need to do that, right? Guy's filthy rich. He's a king. He could have done nothing. And then what were they going to say about it? Nothing. But he didn't. He brought it all. And not so he could be praised. It's so that he could be praised, right? And so here also, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 2. Check it out. For I know how eager you are to help, and I've been boasting to the churches in Macedonia that you in Greece were ready to send an offering a year ago. In fact, it was your enthusiasm that stirred up many of the Macedonian believers to begin giving. You see it there? It was their generosity that stirred up the other people to be generous as well. So not only do you bring your offerings so that there's men much in the storehouse so we can meet the physical needs of those that are especially within the family of God that are constantly in need, and they are. The needs are real, and they're almost daily at our church. And I'm always saying no, because we don't have. And I would say that we do. It's just not in the right place. Okay? Now, let's land the plane, not really quickly, but let's just start our descent. 
We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm just going through the scriptures and we're just gleaning from it what we need so that God can transform us. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 6, is a section of scripture that is very controversial. And the reason why it's very controversial is because you go on TV and you see these guys come on and say, plant your seed, plant your seed, plant your seed, and if you give 50, you get tenfold back, right? Okay, that's foolishness. I'm, I'm not doing that. There's no guarantees there. I mean, I was watching a thing uh, with a guy, Benny Hinn. Maybe some of you guys have watched it. You can like him. You cannot like him. That's, that's your business. But he's been kind of preaching that for years and years, and he came out recently and said, I'm done with that. I'm, I'm denouncing that teaching because I don't know hardly anybody who ever got the promise that we promised. And I'm hurting people, and I can't do that anymore. It's like, okay. But here's the thing. What happens is when you, when you start hearing this stuff about the seeds, sowing seeds, sowing seeds, get money, get money, get money, that's abuse. So what people tend to do is in, in, in this environment of, of abuse, we neglect it. But the problem is this, God's word's not to be abused, and it's not to be neglected, it's to be obeyed, okay? And so we don't just, we don't just grab an eraser and erase this part out because some people have abused it. Our challenge is to read it, meditate on it, and obey it, okay? That's what I want for you. So look, look here in the text, let's just, let's just read this, <coughs> Nine through, uh, 6 through 13. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. You see the prayer thing there? That's why we pray. God, what do you want us to do? What do you want me to do? Like, because my offering is going to be different than yours, right? Just because just Troy pops this much in there, that doesn't mean I have to, right? I pray. I, maybe he tells me to do 100. Maybe he tells me to do four. I don't know. But it's not the same for everybody. That's why each person gives according to what, you know, you got a relationship with the Lord. Did you know this? You can talk to him. He'll tell you some things. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will graciously provide all you need. Think about that, loved ones. Think about that astounding offer from the one who spoke the planets into existence. You don't have to do it on your own anymore. He wants to help you. Man. He will give you all that you need. Then you will always have everything you need. That's awesome. And... Plenty left over to share with others, right? See, that's the thing. A lot of people are, are teaching this stuff so that they can have more, right? But the Bible's clear here. It says that he's doing these things so that you can, thanks, brother, so that you can, thank you. He says, be generous so that I can bless you and give you all that you need. Like if he left it there, that'd be good, right? That'd be good. But he says also, he's not asking you to be generous so he can make you wealthy. He's making you, he wants you to be generous so he can make you more generous. Do you see it there? It, it's not gathering more wealth for self. It's gathering more so you can give and help more people. Do you see it there in the text? Do you not? Do you see it? Do you see it? God will, gen will generously provide all you need. Then you'll always, that's a big word, always have everything. He's speaking in absolutes. God can do that. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. And those of us that are being generous out of our poverty, we have discovered this truth to be, to be evident that we actually have money. I actually have money sometimes. Listen, loved ones. You guys pay me $2,000 a month. Last week we gave our offering. This is, to this is just to stir up some more generosity, okay? I'm nothing, I'm nothing, I'm nothing. But listen, we gave, what was it? How much did we give? Th three, three, ten? Three, you, we make two grand a month. And we gave 310 back to the church. That was our tithe and offering. We have an $890 mortgage 
insurance, gas, electric, all that. Right? You understand this, right? You understand where I'm going? I don't have enough. But I'm just telling you right now, if someone needed 20 bucks from me, I'm, I've got it. I don't know how, but I do, right? Somehow in the generosity, he gives us all that we need and, and then more left over so we can help others that are in legit need. You understand this? I'm living this now. I'm, I've been living this for 10 years. I don't make enough to live, and I'm getting fatter all the time. He gives us more so we could be provided for and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and bread to eat. And in the same way, he will provide and increase your resources. Why? So you can be rich? Here's the prosperity gospel. Be generous. Be rich. But look what it says. He says, in the same way, he will provide and increase your resources, then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. That's what he's looking for. He's not out there to try to make you rich so you can go, hey, look at me. He's out there to help you have plenty of resources so you can tell others to look at him. That's what it's all about. Look here. Yes, you'll be enriched in every way so you can always be generous. See, he's saying it's more than just money, isn't it? You'll be enriched in every way so you can always be generous. It's not to be rich so that you can be rich. It's to be rich so you can be generous. And look, watch this. And when we take our gifts to those who really need them, they will, here's some results, they will thank God. So two things will result from this ministry of giving. And, and let's make this practical because you give here, okay? What happens when you give? The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met. That means there's stuff in the storehouse to help people. You see it? And they will joyfully express their thanks to God. You see how the giving goes vertical? As a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God. You see there? See, generosity begets generosity in the, in the giver. Generosity meets the needs of the people and brings glory to God. That's the promised crop that he's talking about. Not a bunch of gold and silver in your house and airplanes so you can fly over the world. It's the crop is ensuring that the needs of the people will be met and that God receives the glory. That's the promised crop that's discussed in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. That's a beautiful crop. And I want to harvest that crop, and I hope that you do as well. Okay? Loved ones, your uh, visit to the dentist has concluded. <laughs> and rinse and spit. Please know that this is not bring your rings here. This is not sell your house. Because then you're going to want to stay at my house. <laughs> you can stay at Mimi's house or at Cindy's house. But not at my house. <laughs> Trying to come up with some wise aleck comment, but I... I got nothing. Listen, I, I, I do love you, but listen, I just, I, I just, can I just say, I appreciate what you said to me earlier about the music, and I, like you, and any true minister of the gospel doesn't want any praise. It's all the working of the Holy Spirit through us, so I'm not praising you either when I say thank you for staying. Thank you. Uh, uh, this is what I want you to do, please. I just want you to take a few moments. 
and just ponder. We don't need to rush. Just ponder. You don't have to agree with everything I said. Like, I've said this a million times. We're not here to reproduce clones of me. This is a non-denominational church, so we have different views when we look at this, right? See, I'm looking at it from here. You're not, are you? You're looking at it from here. We see things differently. And we're different people, and that's okay. But I would just say this. I've, I've shared a lot of God's word with you this morning, and I just want it to bear its weight in your life. And if you allow God's word to shape who you are and how you live, then all things work out for the good. They do. They just do. So take a few moments, and we're going to pray about that before we do an offering. Okay, but I want to just change up just a little bit right here. We're going to bring up a song for you right now that I'd love for you to sing. And it's very apropos for this moment. Because what I've shared with you can be very difficult because I know a lot of people in this room are saying, but I don't have, but I don't have. I want to, but I don't know if I can. I don't know if I trust you. I don't know if, I just don't know if, it's hard, I know, I get it. When I, my wife's the one who encourages generous giving in my house, but when I gave her the number this week, last week, she even questioned me. It's hard. So I want to give you an opportunity to sing this song. Let this song not only praise Jesus, but let it free you as you're singing it so that you can feel comfortable letting God lead you in this. Because I know it's hard. Okay? Come on.